What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on a friend of mine. He is the founder and chair of You Are the Power, and he has also run as a vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party in the USA as well. And this is the one and only Spike Cohen. Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm looking forward to, to talking with you. How's, awesome, how's Miami I, treating you? Miami is good, bro. Miami is a beautiful city. It's a great place yes. to be, especially at this time of year. Um, yeah, much better than the UK. <laughs> I would imagine so, yeah. <laughs> much better, about uh, 20, 25 degrees warmer. I hope I got everything correct in that intro right there. So no, that, for people who don't know you, yeah, awesome. For people who don't know you, Spike, tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure, absolutely. Uh, my background is in business development. Uh, I started my first company when I was 16 back in 1998. I'm aging myself now. You're all going to learn just how old I am in this episode. <laughs> uh, but that was my first company. I started a web design company that led to uh, being involved in the startup and, and maintenance and, and growth of, of multiple small businesses over the years. Uh, oh gosh, what, se seven years, six years ago, seven years ago, uh, starting this year, um, after a diagnosis of, uh, of multiple sclerosis, I decided to retire from the for-profit world and, and get involved in what my true passion was, which was to try to grow the liberty movement and, and show people that we do better when we're most free. Uh, that led a couple of years later to my being the vice presidential candidate, as you mentioned, and now I'm doing work uh, on the cultural side, uh, less so on the political or electoral side with uh, my nonprofit, You Were the Power. I hear that, man. Before we get into all of the Liberty stuff and all the work that you're doing now, tell me more about your your background and your childhood. Where did you grow up? Sure. So I was born in Baltimore, but we fled there very early in my in my life. And anyone who's either from Baltimore or has fled Baltimore knows what I'm talking about. Uh, we uh, we live in uh, I, I actually still live in the Myrtle Beach area in South Carolina. That's where I grew up. And um, an interesting thing is that uh, I, the reason that I started my first business when I was so young was my parents were very insistent that uh, when I was like during the summers in between school, as soon as I could, that I go and get a job. And it wasn't because we needed the money or anything like that, but it was to teach me the value of money, the value of hard work and all of that. And uh, so when I was 13, which technically illegal, but when I was 13, uh, I started uh, during the uh, summers, I would I would work about, I don't know, maybe 30 hours a week, 20 hours a week, busting tables at a uh, at a, a nearby restaurant. And uh, I did that for a couple of summers. And uh, and then I did landscaping one summer as well. And, and what I learned doing all that stuff, I learned the value of of working hard and working smart, finding ways to, to do the work as, as good as possible uh, and, and not overwork myself and still get the job done. But I also learned the value of networking uh, in the restaurants. The waiters and waitresses that I made friends with would tip me out. So I made more money by networking. Uh, so I learned the value of schmoozing and all of that. Um, another, but the biggest thing I'd say that I learned was I would look around landscaping, bussing tables, washing dishes and all of that. And I would see people two and sometimes three times my age doing the exact same thing and making not that much more than me. And I, I realized I don't want to do this. I don't want to work for someone else. And so I never have actually, uh, I, I had never actually made a, a paycheck because when I stopped doing that, I realized I wanted to stop doing that and, and start my own business. And so at the age of 16 years old and, and uh, with, a, with a laptop that my parents handed down to me, I learned how to do the software. I started going out, making connections, and uh, yeah, that turned into a, a successful business. Uh, what, what exactly was that first business? It was a website design company. So okay. at the, you know, when I was, I was trying to figure out what's a job that doesn't require me to have to go to college, because that looked like a scam. Even before this big student debt bubble and all of that, you know, you go to school for four to eight years. And unless you want to be like a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, it, the numbers didn't seem to make sense to me. Pay all this money to go and get something that you need to go and work. Having been off the job market for four to eight years of your most productive years, it just didn't make sense to me. And so I thought, OK, what what can I do where I don't have to go to a college where I don't have to? Um, you know, the, the licensing stuff isn't that expensive. I just had to get a business license. Uh, I don't need a storefront. And also at 16, what's someone going to take me seriously doing showing up in my, you know, broke down 88 LeBaron and telling people that I, I have my own business and web design was just new enough that a, a 16 year old offering those services kind of made sense and tracked and it worked for me. It was a, a very successful company. 
That's awesome, man. And how did you get involved in the whole libertarian thing? When did you become a libertarian? So I became a libertarian philosophically after many years of being a neocon and buying into, you know, keep in mind, I was 19 when 9-11 happened and I, mm -hmm. I saw the Twin Towers go down and I was just as angry and scared as everyone else. But because I didn't have the context of the history of what led to that, I bought the media and government narrative hook, line and sinker. And I, I'm embarrassed of the things that I believe at the time. Um, and but it's hearing people like Ron Paul and Matt Kibbe and, and uh, these annoying libertarians who kept saying, if you want a small government that stays out of your business, then you're not going to get it with this global empire and you're not going to get it with this massive surveillance state they're building. That's not going to work. And I thought that they were anti-American. They just wanted the terrorists to win. And over time, I just realized they were right. Every prediction they made came true. Everything they said was going to happen ended up happening. And so that made me really re-examine what I believed and that led to me becoming a libertarian. I didn't actually get involved in the libertarian party uh, until shortly before I ran for uh, the, the vice president presidential uh, nomination because I didn't really see a use for electoral politics. And I realized at a point that you can use that as a purpose for messaging and getting the message out there. And if you can get actual you know, libertarians elected, then all the better. But if nothing else, you're getting a message out there that you're not going to hear from Republicans or Democrats. Mm -hmm. I hear that. So I have a real global audience. I'm sure some people are going to be familiar with libertarianism. Other people mm -hmm. are not. But break down for us what it actually means to be a libertarian or what libertarianism is all about. Sure. So, I mean, the, the elevator pitch version, because you could find a libertarian who will talk to you for hours about, you know, the, the, all of these intricacies of our philosophy. But basically, we recognize that uh, people do best when they're most free. And we recognize that the problems that we face are often either created or made worse or created and made, made worse by the fact that there's too much power in the hands of too few people. We believe in voluntary interaction over coercive force. We believe that uh, power should be as decentralized as possible down to the individual whenever possible. We, we recognize that if there is to be a government, it should only exist to protect lives, rights, and property. It should not be telling you how to live your life. It does not know better than you do how to do things. Uh, and uh, and the, the problems that we face are often as a result of an arrangement where a bunch of people with no real accountability and, and way too much power are imposing themselves on you. And, and libertarians propose taking that power and putting it back in your hands where it always belongs. I hear that. And of course, I, uh, of course, I believe, believe that strongly. In, in your view, g given when you talk to libertarians, you know, of course, even within that space, there's quite a broad range of just how far people think that philosophy should go. So <laughs> in your personal opinion, I mean, you, you have full on, uh, you know, anarchists or anarcho cap, you know, you have people who think the entire government, you know, entire state top to bottom should, should not exist on, on, any, yes. on any level. You have other people who are more like you know, conservative, libertarian, libertarian leaning conservatives um, or moderates who are like, OK, you know, a government must exist and right. will, but it's doing too much and it should be significantly scaled back. You have mm -hmm. people in the middle. In your own view, especially as someone who has run within the political system, what's yeah. your what's your view on that? Yeah, so I am an anarcho-capitalist um, and okay. uh, the the two main camps within libertarianism are, are the anarchists and various types of anarchists, which basically to say that you know, what we believe in terms of non-aggression and, and, uh, and respect for human autonomy and all of that stuff, just because someone calls themselves the government doesn't suddenly exempt them from that. And so a, an mm -hmm. ideal society is a truly free market one where all services that people need are being uh, provided in a voluntary way by co um, cooperating and competing providers. And, and, you know, there is no presumption of authority because someone said so. Then there are the minarchists who say there's always going to be a government, and if there's going to be a government, then it should, you know, respect lives, rights, and property, and, and that's all it should do. Um, I mm -hmm. am an anarchist from a philosophical standpoint. I also live in the same real, actual world that you and everyone watching this live in. I know that if there were a, a button that I could press that would make government go away, and I pressed it, everyone would turn around and go, what the hell did you just do? And then they'd go <laughs> right back to work. They'd go right back to work making a new government, which would almost yeah. certainly be worse 
than what it replaced. Like one of the few <laughs> graces that most governments have is that there's, you know, uh, from, you know, hun dozens or hundreds of years ago, some document that's somewhat restricting them even even mildly. And, you know, if they're everyone's angry, I just press the button, they're going to make the worst government ever. So I recognize that we do have a government. It ain't going away. It's actually growing at, a, at an astounding rate. And I'm also an incrementalist. I realize that we're not going to have you know, spike topia tomorrow or even or, yes. you know, even possibly within our lifetimes. We need to work within the system that we have and make. And when I say incremental, I don't mean small, little marginal changes. We need to work for bold, big changes, but they're going to naturally come uh, incrementally. We're not going to tell seven billion people you have to live voluntarily. And if you don't, bad things are going to happen like that's that's a new form of dictatorship. Instead, mm -hmm. we need to work within the not just the systems in terms of government systems but the existing people the, the consciousness that people have right now the beliefs that they have right now that's what i do with you or the power i i find issues and causes that we can help people on and use it as an opening conversation about how we wouldn't even be facing these things if the power was more in your hands and less in the hands of a bunch of people who don't know more than you they know less than you typically and they don't care about you mm -hmm. Why do people with normal cholesterol levels get heart attacks? Heart surgeon Dr. Philip Ovedia believes it's because of poor metabolic health, not cholesterol. After performing over 3,000 heart surgeries, Dr. Ovedia decided to work on prevention and not just treatment. In his book, Stay Off My Operating Table, Dr. Ovedia shows you his seven principles of metabolic health and how to use them to reduce your risk of heart disease. Get your free audiobook version of Stay Off My Operating Table at ifixhearts.com forward slash Zuby. That's ifixhearts.com forward slash Zuby to get your free audiobook. Go check it out. Theoretically, what would an anarchist society look like on something the size and scale of a country like the USA? What would that look like um, in practice in your mind? Well, in practice, it wouldn't look like a gigantic United States, right? Like the only okay. thing that holds a giant country together is the the force that would be applied if someone tried. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, secession. And anytime mm -hmm. it comes up or, 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 or even subdivision within existing states, there's been talk about, you know, people seceding from California and forming the state of Jefferson, I think it's called. And, and there's been other talk of things like that. And anytime any of that talk comes up, people say, no, you know what, if you tried to secede, you, you know, we've already had wars about that. That's already been settled. You can't do that. Well, the, the threat there is if you try to leave and make your own thing, even keeping a, a government system but just a new one will kill you mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's you know any any arrangement where if you don't stay in this will kill you uh obviously in an in anarchist or in a voluntary society that wouldn't exist so what it would look like is um outside of government it would look largely what it looks like now outside of government people form uh um, associations and alliances and 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 working groups voluntarily you and i who have uh, uh we met online we've met a handful of times in person now uh our nationalities are completely different we live uh, uh thousands of miles well you live everywhere now but we live thousands <laughs> of miles uh we live thousands of miles away from each other we formed some kind of uh you know working relationship because we decided voluntarily that there's a mutual benefit to that so it would look like that but also on a societal level it would look more like mm -hmm. neighborhoods uh, uh having uh, their own like kind of uh, mini societies and then having alliances with other ones as well as opposed to having one big imposed system one size fits all for everyone i get that would there still be would there still be states in such a system or would the united states as we know it not really be the united states and just be a ton of neighborhoods and communes i i would say in a stateless society, there wouldn't be states as such. So there wouldn't be mm -hmm. a presumption of authority within a state. What there okay. would be is what holds people together, which is their individual bonds, their relational bonds, their cultural bonds, 
the things that states actually initially grew out of were those things. Mm -hmm. your, your cultural bonds, your, your ethnic bonds, your values bonds. And in the, the world we live in now where we're all as connected to one another by technology as I am to my neighbor right here, uh, a lot of those things that used to matter more like you know just the geographic location you have between people, those don't matter as much. So I think what you would have is a lot of free people who would be on a case by case basis uh, uh, associating and disassociating with people as they wish. And, and I also want to say this isn't going to be some utopia. There would still be conflict. There would still yeah. be crime. There would still be bad things happening. But the conditions that allow for the massive amounts of corruption and mass murder and imposition of something like a COVID regime or, or anything like that, they wouldn't exist because there wouldn't be that much centralized authority. Yeah. How would you deal with conflict in such situations on a sort of on, on a low level and on a high level. I mean, so say, say you're talking about low level, you know, s standard crimes, you know, people being, because, because right now, of course, in whatever country you're in, everyone yeah. is used to the typical model. Okay. You have the, you have police forces, you have the justice system, you yeah. have things on a state level and on a federal level. Um, if there's a conflict or as people are trying to violate each other's rights, property, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Uh, commit violence. Uh, what would that what would that then look like um, without the justice system as we currently know it and without the right. policing system as we currently know it? What would that all look like? Right. So uh, keep in mind, any civil society is going to have a lot of the same things that we have now. They're just going to be something that people can choose to opt out of and form new associations as they see fit, as they as they mm -hmm. wish. So any civil society is going to have, like, for example, an arbitration system. If you're saying conflict like I mean, you could say uh, I mean, there are different types of conflict, but like a more minor conflict, like I say that you owe me money that you didn't fulfill a contract and you're saying, you know, no, I didn't. Then there would still be these kinds of arbitration systems that people could have. Right. Like it, it, you don't need a government to do that necessarily. So there would still be arbitration. There would still be security forces. There would still be enforcement of uh, rules and standards for people in in privately owned communities that they have. All those things would still exist. What you wouldn't have is the middlemen of politicians and bureaucrats and cronies. You would have mm -hmm. people that were making these decisions and mostly through private law and through contract law, making these decisions of how things are going to operate and then operating accordingly and having any kind of arbitration or security that's needed. Again, not a perfect mm -hmm. system, but still a good one. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I'm curious to, because I'm one of those people who I don't I don't love political labels. Um, philosophically, I'd say, and and even practically, I'd say I'm certainly more libertarian leaning. I'm yeah. not a full on, you know, I'd never define myself as an <laughs> as, a, as an anarchist or an, an right. ANCAP, L largely because um, I don't. J just like how on the on the full on opposite end of the aisle, you have people who are you know ideologically like pure socialists or even or even yeah. communists right? right just just right. like practically i mean that that, that one we we they've really tried to sort of <laughs> put put into practice with some with some terrible results so Horrific whilst results, i yeah. can yeah. yeah horrible results um while i can sort of understand philosophically how someone gets there or thinks that's a good idea mm -hmm. i also wonder when i when i hear about anarchist philosophy is the the thought of okay but like practically what does that what would that look like i mean i don't know right. if there are any there are any w with communism we have examples right we have ex historic examples okay well yes. if you actually put this into pl move move out of the theoretical realm if you actually put this into practice this is how it plays out over the years yeah, yeah, yeah. um with a truly anarchist society especially anything at scale i'm aware that there's little you know communes and things like that of but course, i'm thinking okay uh, on on a nation scale especially a big nation usa 330 340 million people like what would that actually look like right. that's what so, i'm trying to you know get my head around right and so this is why i say i'm philosophically anarchist from the standpoint yeah. of i believe that the closer we can get to a truly voluntary and free market society the better 
it hasn't been done at scale for any long period of time. I know there are some people that have given specific examples. I know one is like the, the Druid societies in, in pre-colonial Ireland. I honestly don't, don't know how accurate yeah. that is. But regardless, the reality is uh, there's also the fact that nothing is static. So every mm. attempt to create a certain form of governance is always constantly changing. Even in the U.S., we had at one point a legitimate attempt at a serious you know, really limited government that had major structural limitations that would make sure that it never grew. And it's now the largest and most expensive and most bloated and most imperialistic government arguably in history. <laughs> so these things happen, right? It's, it's not a static thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's the old saying, you know, everyone is one generation away from tyranny. And, and honestly, we're one virus away from tyranny. And so I, the, what I would say is, Philosophically, my my guiding light is mm -hmm. that we need to have power as decentralized as possible and that we need people to be that people should be as free as possible. We do best when we are respecting people's autonomy when we're not imposing ourselves on them and people aren't imposing themselves mm -hmm. on us, except in defense of self or others. Mm -hmm. I live in the same world that you do. So, yeah. I mean, sure, I'm happy to sit here and talk about, well, this is what this would look like, that's what that would look like. And then we can play a game of Dungeons and Dragons and have largely mm -hmm. the same effect. Like, it, it doesn't actually matter from a how we're going to try to get from where we are to some better point, right? I don't mind talking about it. But at the same time, there are people that are being hurt right now and that are being harmed right now on a massive scale and on individual scales. And for me to spend a tremendous amount of time going, and then in a, in a private society, then there would mm -hmm. be these special kinds of association organizations and things like that. You know, we can certainly, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but I also, I think it is more useful to use that belief as a philosophical <clears throat> foundation to talk about how we can get somewhere closer to a freer mm -hmm. society. And so that's where yeah. I focus. Like you are the power. We don't try to advocate for anarchy. We're advocating for a reduction in uh, in centralization of power and in people sure. for for people to recognize that that they can trust themselves more than they can politicians and bureaucrats and so forth. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that concept is so foreign to people to the point that libertarianism itself as a concept? I say this especially being from the UK, at least in the USA. A lot of people have heard of libertarian. If you if you go to the UK, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, say say the word libertarian, people are like what, what does that even what what, what does that even mean? Um, right. So why is that concept so foreign? Do you think it's just the fact that the state as it as we know it has existed and persisted for so many centuries, and you know people have never even thought of a way outside of that, or do you think that most people? genuinely believe that something closer to what we currently have is what's optimal i think that what has happened and, and it, again things not being static this has gotten worse over time i think that what we are largely seeing is the result of big government progressive status being in control of every lever of power in society especially education so from mm -hmm. a very early age even before you can speak and when your brain is still you know still forming and and you're still having a hard time even understanding ideas but they're still being presented to you we are presented with the idea that government equals authority equals safety equals good um, and so by the time we're, you know, even in our adolescence, those things are kind of hardwired into into our brain. And so then if we even if we are more on the pro liberty side, uh, then we are then. And, and most people, I think, have a liberty streak at the very least. They have a thing that they don't think anyone should. It's no one's business. And if the government gets involved, it only makes it worse. But then they find themselves looking for whoever is going to provide them with the protection on the things that they think government should be doing for them. And I, I would say the biggest if you had to, there are many reasons, but the biggest single thing is the fact that you know, the entire education system is controlled. And when I say progressives, I don't just mean, you know, in the US, you know, left wing Democrats, I mean, the people who believe that government should be bigger tomorrow than it is today. And that's the vast majority of people. And it's something that's being passed down along to other people, all evidence mm -hmm. to the contrary ignored. I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this question. What's the what are your thoughts between I and I say this is you know, I, I, tr I travel the world a lot and have lived in lots of different places and experienced different types of governments and systems, you know, especially having grown mm. up in the Middle East. 
Yeah. And how important do you think the size of in, in the U.S. people always talk about, you know, big government, small government, limited government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But people often don't talk about like the quality of it. Right. Like a, is it, how, how, how good is it? How corrupt is it? How bad is it? How efficient right. is it? How inefficient it is? So sometimes I wonder and this may differ country to country, but I'm curious to, to hear your take on this is the the importance on and focus and emphasis on the size versus the the quality and the good right. or bad of, of, of what it actually does. Because I'm, I'm sure, you know, we can think of countries that have a, you know, in some ways their government is quite big and overarching, but it's not at least on a surface level, it's not, it's not tyrannical per se. Right, like it's, it's, right. it's functional. And then there's other places where, I mean, on, on the other end, you have places with like very, very, very small governments, but what they have is extraordinarily corrupt and right. what they're yep, doing yep. is, I don't know. I, I, I hear a lot of talk about the, the scale and sometimes I'm like, mm, what's, I don't know. I, 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 my, my view is that I think for different nations and different societies, you, you need different solutions. Um, I don't well, and, really think it's a one size fits all thing. And I agree it's not a one size fits all thing. You know, going back to the idea of, of anarchy, if I snap my finger and all government went away, seven billion people aren't going to all voluntarily organize the exact same way. Like it's yeah. that's not you've got cultural aspects, you've got, you know, all sorts of things to, to factor in there. There are mm -hmm. some people, their cultures are more based on building consensus. Right. So like mm -hmm. it would be weird to say uh, or, or it would be socially awkward to say something like, well, you know, this is you know, th th this is my individual rights. And they'd say, yeah, but what about the community? So even yeah, yeah. a voluntary society would be very communal in nature in that. Going to your question, when I say big government, I mean centralization of authority. Now, usually that also means that it's bigger. It has more people working for it. It has a bigger budget. It has more, you know, uh, uh, imposition and control. It's got a bigger military industrial complex, it, you know, and all of those things, but not necessarily. I mean, you know, I, there are many uh, places, especially in like the global south, the so-called third world, where the government that that's there, we might see it as small, but yet it's yeah. very tyrannical, but it's tyrannical mm -hmm. because it's in control of everything, right? Like the, all authority is centralized into whatever it is, small as it may be, you know, threadbare as its, as its budget may be, it's still in control of, of things. Uh, it's an interesting point because a lot of one thing that was that was interesting about the, the COVID regime and, and still is, is that a lot of governments that you would look at them and go, well, yeah, they're big or, or, or they're, you know, Im they impose themselves on things, but they're actually, you know, you can live a pretty good life there and it's not really that tyrannical. Well, the thing is, it turned out that in many of those cases, it was just that the population was so conditioned to live that way that there wasn't a lot of trouble because they were used to living that way. But then you mm -hmm. have a, a like Australia, most people, if you would say Australia, that wouldn't be the first country they would think of when they think tyranny. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And yet it's very, there was a, very, it, very status there. Very status. It's very um, statist. And, and, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say I went there for the first time in um, in October last mm -hmm. year. Yep. And um, I mean, yeah, like they love rules, like rules. It, it's it's much more um, even compared to, you know, the UK. Um, yep. It's much more rules and regulations and, yep. you know, authority. And someone actually explained to explained to me why they think that that is. Um, and this is that because I like it when I learn something new or I'm given a new idea, which I've genuinely never thought of before because it doesn't actually happen yeah. <laughs> that much these days. But uh, I was talking to this person in Australia and they said that the reason Australia sort of formed like that is actually largely because of its geography. So Australia is the same size as the USA, excluding right. Alaska, right? But it's only 20, 25 million people and people are kind of like spread around um, primarily on the outskirts, not in the middle of the country. So uh, this guy was explaining to me that historically they've always needed, um, you know, or thought they needed at least a, a strong state in order to, you know, because of the geographical challenges in order to actually function um, the, the, the state sort of re made all these regulations and ways of doing things and, and even building the infrastructure, the highways, everything to actually connect people and make this right. gigantic island sort of function. And as a result, over those decades and decades, p 
people naturally lean lean towards the state and yeah. expect the state to sort of do all of these things and don't really question it because it's always been that way. And as a result, that's what's led to the mentality there overall being much more status than it is uh, certainly in the USA, but even compared to the UK or other parts of Europe and so on. So I thought that was actually quite an interesting way because I'd never thought of how the geography itself um, could be a factor in the sort of downstream mentality. It could definitely be some. What's interesting is I still think there's a cultural aspect because, for example, in the U.S. during our frontier phase was when in many ways it was at its most libertarian, certainly in those frontier yes. communities. So it's weird how people will react to those kinds of challenges. I think but maybe they, it's because, oh, sorry to interrupt. I think maybe yeah. it's because it also um, the USA, you know, was like an, a country, you know, immigrants and entrepreneurs Whereas Australia was a prison island. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that that's a big part of it. I think that you had a lot of people that this was their institution. They, they, it was yeah. an open air institution, but it was still an institution. Whereas in the U.S., it was a place that people either were born there or came there to seek this you know, new life or whatever. But mm. I, I will still say, even though it was very statist and some of the Scandinavian countries and even Canada, they were very statist, but people wouldn't think those places necessarily when they think tyranny. They think communist China and, and, and the usual suspects. But then you have like in Australia, you have, you know, for a, quite a period of time, if your contact tracing app that you were forced to have on your phone showed that you were within contact of someone who had COVID, they'd put you in a camp. Yes, it was a nice gilded cage, but you couldn't, <laughs> there was no option to leave. And if you were, God forbid, you were one of those people that, you know, had COVID and, and, and continued testing positive for weeks afterwards, even though you never really felt anything, uh, you were going to stay there for weeks and weeks and weeks until, you know, they finally allowed you to go. It was literal camps for people that yep. may or may not even be positive uh, for a virus that, you know, had a, a, a you know, a, 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 what, half a percent fatality rate. And, and so as, and, the, the point that I make there is that what may look like, you know, a soft or padded tyranny, the moment that the population goes, wait a second, I don't think I like this. Suddenly it's not so soft anymore. You saw what the Canadian Mounties were doing, stomping on the on the throats of, of indigenous protesters saying, you know, why are we so being forced to mask and socially distancing? We live in the middle of nowhere. What are you doing? And they would come in hard and heavy. And that's the problem is it may seem like it's you know, big or has a lot of authority, but is kind and, and only has your best interests at heart until the very moment you say no thanks. And now there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm still sort of piecing together. There's still so many questions and fallout from the last few years. Because another thing that was confusing, of course, uh, is the way that Sweden, of all the European countries, was the one that was just like, nah, F this. Like, we're not, we're not doing, right? Like, like you would not think the place where you can be paying, you know, 60% 60, 60 tax rates and yeah. where, you know, it's known for being much more socialistic leaning. Um, you know, you don't think, if you're thinking of like based Europeans, you're not exactly thinking, oh yeah, like the Swedes. Sweden, like they're, they're, yeah. They're yeah. the ones that are going to stand up, right? They're the ones that yeah. you, you'd be like, no. And, and it's, it's, it's quite amazing throughout the whole thing. No mask mandates, no vax mandates. They pretty much didn't do lockdowns, all their nightclubs and everything, concert yeah. venues stayed open, even through from early 2020. And I'm just like, man, this is so this is so interesting. It's not a yeah. I, I don't think it's how people would have expected how, how people would have expected it to play out. I certainly wouldn't have. I didn't think any of the Scandinavian countries, certainly not Sweden, would be the one that would be like, hey, entire Western world. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. We're not doing yeah. that. And, and what's crazy is we watch what happened. The entire government and media complex came down on them hard. And when they initially had a higher rate of infections of death, uh, everyone's like, see, look, it's failing. And then, of course, you know, months later when it's all averaged out and they're pretty much in the same, they're in the middle of all the other countries in terms of infections and deaths and never had any of the nonsense that came with the lockdowns and the, and the mandates, uh, or at least not the more restrictive ones, suddenly they were quiet about it. And, and even within the states, we saw that, right? Like South Carolina, where I am, we had a, 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 they wouldn't even call it a lockdown because politically they couldn't do that. They called it a pause. And it was supposed to be up to 30 <laughs> days and they abandoned it after about two weeks because, you know, everyone's, first of all, people weren't obeying it. I wasn't allowed to go to the beach. I went to the beach every <laughs> single day. And it's like March. It wasn't even nice. It was cold and I'm still going. I'm like, screw that. You tell me I can't go somewhere. I'm going somewhere. And so, you know, Florida dropped it after about a month. South Carolina dropped it after a couple weeks. South Dakota never had it. And yet our infections and age-adjusted deaths were 
roughly the same as California, New York, mm -hmm. Washington. After you gave it about a year and all the different you know ebbs and flows happen, it was roughly the same because it turns out, I know this is going to be shock to you and everyone else, a highly transmissible respiratory virus isn't going to be stopped with a game of red light, green light. Like it's just, it's not going to work. Like this thing doesn't care if you're only going to the store and not to the sun tanning booth or, you know, or, or that you're, you're, you know, staying in your poorly ventilated home and not going to the park. Like it doesn't care. It doesn't care if you do that. Yeah, no, you have to wear a double mask too. Double mask, but not when you're eating, when you <laughs> sit down. I, I, I love saying, you know, listen, when you go into the restaurant, very, very dangerous because COVID's right around like here. I'm sitting down right now, mm -hmm. so it's like Head here. High, yeah. But once you sit down, COVID's not going to infect you while you're eating. It's a virus, not a monster. No. It's not going to ruin polite. your meal. It's polite. But when, it's polite, but if you get up, yeah. dead. Dead. <laughs> we laugh at the fact that during the Cold War, they would tell like my, my parents' generation, some of your grandparents' generation, that when the nukes came from the Ruskies, that you get under your tape, under the school desk or under your chair and, and you know, wait for the, the, the fallout to end. And yet we were literally telling grown adults with a straight face that you had to make sure that from when you walked into the restaurant, you had a mask on until you sat down, in which case you could take it off because now everything is fine. But don't you dare stand up. It's like some it's like that. Um, what was that show called with that movie called? It was a Netflix movie Bird Box. It's like Bird Box, oh, but yeah. you're OK if you're sitting down. It's just nonsense. Do you know what was remarkable about that particular thing you're discussing and some of the other policies is that they were global. I went to eight different countries during this thing. What you just described, that was the rule in every country. Everywhere. Everywhere. And I, that, that's the part that like was, that's where I was like, man, is this centralized, right? Like how, how are, you know, the arrows in the shopping malls, the uh, two meters or six foot uh, social distancing, yeah. even, even the language, practice social distancing, right? There were these certain phrases and words, I which that, yeah. I'd never, like I'd never heard someone say practice social distancing any time before 2020, like that phrase, I like it, it, it was just weird. And I was like, how, okay, whether I'm in Mexico or I'm in Dubai or I'm in the UK or I'm in Turkey or how are you all doing the same thing? Like, and the whole that's thing, weird. And the whole thing was absurd. So I, I was running for vice president and traveling around the country when most people were, were either stuck at home or defying orders in their own, their <laughs> own way, but maybe not by traveling to 35 states in a, in a two month <laughs> period. And so I'm at the airport and I'm watching you know, the mask mandates and I'm watching people, they're wearing these flimsy cloth masks because it's loud in there and because they can't see each other's mouths moving so they can't hear them as well. They're standing this close to each other. You can see their mask moving from the air coming out, hitting each other yelling at each other to try to understand for their safety of course and then of course when it's time for us to line up for the the plane everyone is being told to you know here is your thing on you remember the little the stickers on the on the yeah. floor and you had to stand yeah. in your sticker and then here we are we're keeping six feet apart to get onto an airplane where I'm now elbow touching multiple strangers I'm within six feet of like 15 people 20 people and we're told please you know, a lot of people compared it to Orwell. I compare it to Kafka. I'm sitting there being told, please practice social distancing while I'm physically touching a stranger. Like it's it's absurd and you couldn't practice. And they'd say, if, if you feel unsafe where you're sitting, we'll put you somewhere else. The plane is packed. Where are you going to put me? Like there's no, there is no social distance. The pilots are six feet away from everyone else, but not each other. And then we'd mm -hmm. get off the plane, having spent however many hours on the plane, sharing the same air, and then we'd get, but we're wearing masks, so that's okay. And then we'd get off and go right back to being six feet apart from each other. The whole thing was insanity. And when you would point yeah. it out to people, they'd go, well, what's your solution? And it's like, well, not this. <laughs> I don't know, something that might work. <laughs> I don't know, something that, you know, if you feel sick, it's stay home and, you know, eat yeah. healthy and, you know, get sunlight and, 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 don't uh you know cow in fear to a a, a virus I, I don't know maybe something like that yeah or we can do this i guess this will work too you know i think one of the there's a lot of basic cognitive human flaws but i think one of them especially when fear takes over is that doing something is always better than doing nothing right I'm so the, I, this whole idea of like you have to do something you have to do something and i'm like well i mean no, well firstly no but the something is like, like what that something is, is really important, right? Like does yes. it, number one, number one, does it work, <laughs> right? Like, is it, is it, is it actually effective? Does it, does it do something? Does it logically and yep. 
actually scientifically like does does it make sense and can you prove is it going to make does? other problems that does, are worse yeah. Yeah. yeah is it what are the long-term <laughs> repercussions of it what are the oh, trade-offs right. um and it was just like we just do something and i'm like well this something is 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 ridiculous this something is causing a lot of problems and this is why we increasingly see governing by crisis everything is a crisis because mm. if you make it a crisis then people's cognitive thought process if they had one uh turns off because now it's okay we'll figure it out long term but right now we have to do this it's just two weeks to slow the spread it's just mm. uh warrantless wiretapping to stop al-qaeda from knocking down our buildings and then not only does that crisis eventually come into context of the actual threat of it but the original power that government was given to do that thing just slowly expands. So like here, the Patriot Act was done to stop the terrorists, specifically Al Qaeda, from doing from doing another 9-11 and to, and to make sure that that never happened again. And last year, uh, it was used to investigate school parents at PTA meetings, right? Like it's, it's being mm. used for everything because, and the reason they were ever given that power to begin with was because everyone was so scared because it was done via crisis. The COVID regime restrictions, if they had just introduced that out of the blue and said, we're gonna do this in case a virus comes, everyone would have said, absolutely not. We're not gonna do that. But if yep. it's COVID, if it's climate change, if it's whatever crisis that they tell you has to be fixed with this thing that a basic, a uh, perusal with common sense would show you is going to do nothing or maybe even make it worse. Now, suddenly everyone just falls into line. I, I like something you said, and, and I agree with it 100 percent. My thoughts on uh, COVID are the same as they are uh, with climate change and with many of these other things. I think it's real. I think that we do need to possibly talk about how we can uh, do actual effective things to deal with it. The last mm -hmm. people I trust to do that are government <laughs> and the corporate crony uh, class, the, the multi-billionaire crony class who whispers into their ear what, what they can do for it. And I, I strongly agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting with it as well is the, the sort of collectivist mentality, right? So I, you know, it, it's funny because even people are like, oh, well, you know, what are your suggestions? Do nothing. I'm like, dude, I've been promoting health and fitness and maintaining a yeah. healthy body weight, yeah. uh, getting sunlight, supplementing with vitamin D, like doing yeah. like, mm -hmm. but these, these things are on the onus of the individual. Right. Yes. I would even argue, look, if you're if you're elderly, if you're immunocompromised, if you're in a particular situation, you know, even things like a, a, a stay at home order or like, you know, do no, not an order. Right. Staying at home just stay or at doing home. certain yeah. things. It's like, yeah, yeah it's, it's like it's like I'm, I've never been like, no, everyone must like, look, if it makes sense for you to do that or it makes sense yeah. for you, your family, your situation. I don't know your situation. Right. If that's yeah. what makes sense for you, uh, like a peanut allergy. Right. I don't think we ban peanuts. <laughs> I don't think I don't think the answer is ban everyone from eating peanuts. I think, and look, yet, you have a peanut for, for yeah, okay. a very small population. Ba minor exposure to peanuts could land them in the hospital or needing an EpiPen, mm -hmm. but we don't ban it for everyone. And we expect that uh, someone who has that kind of an extreme allergy to something so common is going to have to make some adjustments, right? Like it yes. sucks. I have MS. There are certain things I can't eat. It'll cause me to flare up. I'm not going to ban those things. I'm going to take some responsibility. <laughs> I didn't give myself MS. It's not fair that I have MS, but I'm not going to say, Zuby, you can't have the seed oils because if I have seed oils, then it causes, you'd probably like banning seed oils, but I, I, <laughs> I, I probably the one thing we could ban, but like, if I have it, I'm going to have a flare up, but I'm not going to tell yeah. you, you can't have canola oil, right? So that's, that's, mm. you know, we, we have to have people. And, and the other problem with that is, when you impose something on them, it abdicates them of personal responsibility. We're already back to people getting sick and going out about their day anyway, because at no point did they have to be responsible for themselves during this mm -hmm. thing. If instead mm -hmm. we had said, hey, look, if you don't feel good, stay home because A, it'll help you get better faster and B, you're not spreading this thing to everyone. If we had done that from the beginning, maybe we would not have people that are walking around coughing and sniffling and sneezing all over each other. But because from the very moment that this started, they were told, don't, pro don't worry, there's a solution. It's us telling you what to do. And they're no mm -hmm. longer being told to do that. They're going back to doing stuff that's stupid. And that's the problem. Yeah. I think something people rarely think about. I actually think about this quite a lot because, and I, th th this might this might sound weird, but is like training, right? Human beings can very much be trained, oh, yeah. right? And I think oftentimes people don't think about 
how you're being trained. And I say this because based off of what you said, right? If you start treating like adults, like children, and you start making every single decision for them and not giving any responsibility, or, you train them to expect that. If you train someone to just expect free money from the government via taxation or whatever, you just train them for years to accept welfare and to expect it and for it to be yeah. something that, you know, they then get mad at, like they, they feel this entitlement. It, yeah. It's similar. I think if you if you had trained people to be like, if you train people in personal responsibility yeah. and that whole mentality and not set the expectation and entitlement that, you know, you're always going to be told what to do or dictated, your hand is going to be held or whatever. People, people get used to that. And I think one of my concerns, and this was already happening prior to the whole C-19 situation, is that I just think that millions and millions of adults have essentially been trained to see themselves as toddlers and to see, you know, the, the government as their daddy and their mommy. And now that they function off of that whole mentality yep. where even if you suggest this alternative or you want to put the onus, you know, decentralized, put the onus back on the individuals, yep. they actually get mad. They throw a tantrum because it's like, no, I want to be I want to be told what to do. Like, tell me to put my mask on. Right. I won't. I, I, it's not enough for me to put my mask on. I want to be told. <laughs> I want to be told to, to put it. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yeah. Right. It's you not have. enough that I make my it's decision. And enough. I'm like, that. that's the part that was crazy to me. I'm like, dude, if yeah. you want to do any of this stuff, I'm not here. You know what? I am kind of anti-mask, but I'm not anti-mask to the point that I'm going to shout at you or or, or or try to have legislation that you can't wear one. I have issues as to why I think they're generally a bad idea. Um, but it's like but you're if you not telling people that, not to wear one. You go ahead. No, I'm not. I'm not. Yep. It just I'm like, yep. yo, this, and again, these are people who ironically, you know, all these years, like, you know, oftentimes the people who are saying all this stuff, people like to label themselves as pro choice. Right. And then suddenly <laughs> when it comes to something that's like truly just like simply, right. OK, like you do that or whatever. And uh, no, that's not enough. They want mandates, mandates, mandates. And I love about the pro-choice on that. They'll say, yeah, yeah, but in this case, it involves someone else's life. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, bro, come now, on. Now, listen, now, and listen, and full disclosure, I actually, I, I've made entire way too long YouTube videos about why I think that government getting involved in the whole abortion thing is only going to make everything worse. But come on. Like, I mean, like, really? At like, least be consistent. Uh, oh. yeah, at least be consistent. Like, <laughs> if, 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 if someone else's life isn't as important as your choice, then let's just be like, let's stay with that, if, if nothing else. But no, I, I think, and, and ultimately, all of that comes from fear. It manifests itself as anger, entitlement, all that stuff is fear and insecurity. All of us are looking for, you know, you, you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're all looking for safety, protection, shelter, food, a, a sense of security, and then and then moving up sense of fulfillment and all that kind of stuff. But you're speaking, you're hitting people's lizard brains. They're scared. They, they, aren't, they aren't expressing it that way and don't even necessarily realize it that way. Although at the height of COVID, they definitely were expressing it as outright, abject, hypochondriac fear. But mm -hmm. it's, it's fear. It's, I need this to be taken care of. And if they've been told their whole lives, even if it's just on this one thing, that no, no, you can't take care of that yourself, we'll take care of it for you. Well, then the expectation becomes, well, I need that taken care of, so take care of it for me. It's very easy to condition people that way. And that's why it leads to people on their own doing stupid stuff because they're waiting for orders from government not to do stupid stuff. Well, if those orders never come and they just tell you to do more stupid stuff, then you're just walking around acting stupid and nothing's getting accomplished, but at least someone's doing something. And that's what matters mm -hmm. to me. I hear that. Spike, speaking for your own country, the USA, what are some what 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 are some of the laws or regulations? What what are the biggest laws and regulations that you would say are I know earlier you mentioned people being hurt by certain mm -hmm. things. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, let, let's let's do it. What what are three? Let's let's make it Two or three. What are two or three, <laughs> three things. laws yeah. or regulations that if, if you could, you know, wave that wave that magic libertarian wand and be like, OK, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I take issue. But but like these particular these things, are the yep. these are the big ones. What, what do you think? So the what, if I had to pick just one and this is me, I'm becoming a peak libertarian at this moment. It would be <laughs> getting government out of currency. The root evil mm -hmm. of all of this, whether we're talking about 
the endless wars, whether we're talking about the endless wars here, like the COVID regime, the war on drugs, things like that, none of that would exist if government had to fund itself the way everyone else does. And the only way they get away from being be, get away from the economic realities that every other organization has is the ability to just create money and say, look, we have all this money. It's the cause of inflation. It's the cause of the massive national debt that we have, that future generations that haven't even been born yet are, are doomed to have to pay off. Uh, it's the cause of these massive bailouts, this huge transfer of wealth from the poorest to the wealthiest. All of that exists because government controls the money supply. You know, if you're playing a mm -hmm. game of Monopoly and, and one of the players doesn't have to play by the rules, they can go to the banker and say, give me a trillion Monopoly notes and stick them all with the bill for it. Then who's going to win that game? Right. So mm -hmm. that would be a big one, not just ending the Federal Reserve, but getting government out of currency. Of all things, currency is something that the market can provide. I mean, Bitcoin was considered a laughable thing outside of 10 years ago, and now it's, you know, uh, per coin, the most valuable currency on Earth. So um, mm -hmm. so that would be one. Another one is getting government out of education. We talked about that earlier on. Government telling your children how life works is going to lead to them thinking that government is how life works. You know, there's mm -hmm. a, I forget who it was who said, you know, you send your children off to Rome or off to Caesar to be educated and you're shocked when they come home as Romans. Well, that's what's happening. You're, you're sending them off to a system that is that was initially designed uh, to create factory workers and soldiers. And now it's really just designed to create cogs in whatever machine machinery is needed. And the most important part of that is teaching compliance. I was terrible in public school. And it was because I was not going, I've, I've been a libertarian from the beginning. And I, I very early on, it was established that I wasn't going to do something someone said, uh, because they told me to. Conversely, I thrived in homeschooling, I'd finish entire curriculums inside of a week because I was trusted. I was empowered and trusted to learn it on my own. I think that we need to get government out of schooling entirely. And what, there's a third one, right? Uh, man, those two would fix so much of it. Um, <laughs> this is specifically a law, not a cultural thing, because I mean, so much of it is just presumption of authority is, is a huge problem. Education, mm -hmm. I don't know, what's the wild card there? I'm going to feel foolish because when this airs, because I'm going to be like, I should have said the third one, but... Um, Education. If, nothing, if nothing's right at the, if nothing's right at the top yeah I yeah i'll yeah. maybe i'll come up with something in a bit but that, that's that's really what uh, those are the two ones right there would solve so much of the problem get government yeah. out of uh, controlling the economy from what we're actually forced to use uh mm -hmm. and uh, and that would actually end the taxation system as well for the most part and uh and and get government out of education that would do a, a huge service to to writing things on on both a cultural and economic level I think those are really interesting answers, actually, because they're answers that for most average people, they're kind of like, what? Right. Those are things that people are oh, so used yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, because people are so used to the government controlling these things that they haven't even sort of taken a step outside the matrix to think of what is, is this actually necessary? Right. It, it's like. It's it's almost it's like a given that the 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 Fed and the central yep. banks control the money yes. system. Like it's it's just yes. it's just a given, right? Yep. Um, yep. Yep. It's a it's a given that uh, the government schools uh, in the UK we call them state schools, US you call them public schools. It, it's it's just a, it's a given that this must exist. In fact, it needs and it, and it needs more money. It's not just that it exists. It's Always. like the government should be Always. doing should be doing more, right? The budget more. the budget isn't big enough. So yep. it's interesting as someone who's also you know a, a big big fan of Bitcoin. Just one of the hardest things of explaining the concept of it isn't that it's a you know a, a limited supply digital currency. Yeah, it's that it's not controlled by any government or central bank or whatever, which is yep, yep, the yep. appeal of it. But it's also yep. the thing that scares people away because people are like, well, people like, but it's not, yeah, they're like, what? But, but it's not it's not controlled by something. And I'm like, man, like you, yep. you're so ingrained in this idea that the money has to come from the government that yep. you can't actually. Well, number one, people sh I mean, you think after the the currency inflating, you know, to the point where. I was looking at just the other day. I think it's a 98% decrease in the value of like a pound and a dollar. Over. Yeah, I can't remember the time frame. Maybe well into the 90s, 150 yeah. it, years it, or something like that. 
I don't know in the UK, but in the yeah. US, the Federal Reserve was started in 1913. Uh, mm -hmm. I think actually technically it started in, it was passed in 1913 and started in 1914. Since that time, the dollar has lost 98% of its value. Yeah. Let's put that another way. Imagine if your money was worth 50 times what it is right now and everything still costs the same. That's how much people have been robbed, but it's happened so slowly yeah. that people aren't noticing it. Or if you notice it, you only notice it if you look over generations of time. And and that's, yeah. And this is with the most powerful and stable of the fiat currencies. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, think about, yeah. think about other dollar. nations. Yeah, they, they, these are the dollars and pounds. I mean, even in the UK, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So my, my dad's a medical doctor. Okay. Uh, my dad's a medical doctor, a physician. First came to the UK to work as a doctor in the 1970s. I can't remember the exact, I don't know the exact year. Do you know what his annual salary was as a medical doctor in the UK in the in the 1970s? NHS? Um, yeah, have, have a gosh. thing. And this is in 50, 50 years sterling. ago. How many yeah, 50 quid years did ago. your dad make? Um, I'm going to throw out what's probably a very low 30,000. 4,000 pounds a year. Four thousand pounds per year as a doctor. Wow. This is in the seventies. This isn't like in the twenties. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. So, so you want to talk about inflation? And this is the pound, right? We're not talking wow. Zimbabwean dollar. So, just to put it in perspective for people, just how how aggressive inflation actually is when it compounds. You think that four grand a year was an above average salary in the seventies in the UK, and now, wow. I mean, four four you know, four grand a month is okay right <laughs> but, like, but is it like per year per year you know that's when you could buy a house for like 10 grand to 12 grand i i know i know i know that the the pounds are worth a little bit more not like it used to be it was like <laughs> double the, the dollar but it's worth a little bit more than the dollar yeah. last i checked but uh At, four grand a month ain't, ain't cutting it guys yeah that's, that's not a, for me okay anyway. yeah for, for for american friends at the time that would have been about Sixty five hundred seventy seven thousand dollars per year, which still is like, but that's but that's well that shows even just inside of that generation of your dad's generation, how much it ha has gone up. I, I came up with my third thing, immunity okay. for government officials. There's been a lot of talk about in the U.S. about qualified immunity. You know, police officers, when they do bad things, should be held just as accountable as the rest of us. That's true. But why are we just mm. focusing on police, judges, prosecutors, CPS workers, politicians, the crony mm -hmm. corporations that they give immunity to, like Pfizer? You know, if you if you mm -hmm. have a, a injury that comes from Pfizer's best selling products or Moderna's best selling products, you can't sue them. At best, you can apply for money from a, uh, a a trust fund that's been set up for people by the government using your money and, and debt money that future generations will have to pay off. Any mm -hmm. system where the people who make the rules and enforce the rules aren't subject to them is already corrupt before they do a single thing it's already corrupt and without fail even the most uh, you know well-meaning and incorruptible people in a system where they have all of the control and none of the accountability for it it's going to inevitably turn into a horrific and tyrannical system far more worse than anything else so yeah get government out of money mm. get government out of schooling and hold them accountable they can make whatever laws they want if they break them they're held just as accountable as the rest of us are I love that. Spike, that's such a fantastic note to end on. Man, there's there's some people I can talk to just, you know, go for hours and hours, but I want to I want to <laughs> respect the I want to respect the length of the podcast right here. Of course. Spike, of course. where can people where can people find and follow you online? Sure, absolutely. I'm all over the place, man. I'm uh, I'm like you. I'm everywhere. I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm even on TikTok for the kids and the and the Chinese government. Um, oh, yeah, and uh What's that? You got some dance videos twerking? Uh, no, no. Uh, no I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Which is why I haven't, blown up, I haven't blown up there because I'm not twerking for liberty. And I won't. I don't have the first of all, I, I have some self-respect and I don't have the lower back for it. So both, it, it, both for multiple reasons, you won't see me twerking, unfortunately. But uh, uh, my website is SpikeCohen.com and uh, the organization that I run, You Are the Power, we help people who need help right now. Uh, we get people organized in their communities to work each other, work with each other voluntarily, and we use it as a way to grow the liberty movement. If you want to find out more about that, you can go to youarethepower.net. We'd love to have you be a part of it. And Zuby, man, I, I appreciate this opportunity to, to come on and talk about stuff. And uh, hopefully I'll see you. Yeah, you're in the States for a little bit. Hopefully I'll see you while you're here. 100%, man. I appreciate you, Spike. Thank you. Thank you, man.